Hello everybody, in this video I'm going to be going through some important contextual information for students who are studying uh, William Blake's Songs of Innocence and of Experience, uh, particularly for their A-level qualifications. Um, but this video might also be useful for students studying Blake, um, for example, for undergraduate um, and even other levels as well. So hopefully this is um, going to be useful in understanding the kind of society and the, the context in which Blake was writing. I just want to make very clear um, that I am creating this video predominantly for students studying A-level uh, literature. Um, we need to remember, of course, that we are studying English uh, or literature. We're not studying history on this course. Um, and of course, where it's true, whereas it's true, that texts will reflect the societal issues of the time that they were written because texts naturally mirror um, the society in which the writer is writing. We need to remember that in English literature, um, we need to use social and historical context in a way that enhances our interpretation of the text in relation to the question, uh, rather than social and historical context being the centre of your essay. Sometimes if students end up writing a lot about social and historical context, um, it begins to sound more like a history essay. And as a result of that, the discussion of the texts or the poems themselves tends to take a back seat. So we need to make sure that we don't just throw in our context just because we know it. We need to use the context to enhance or complement our analysis of a particular poem in relation to the specific tasks that you get. So I just want to make that very clear before we kind of look at each of these different chapters of this video, so to speak. Um, I also want to make it clear that I am not a historian um, and whenever I teach Blake, uh, the art I think of teaching literature is to make sure that students have enough contextual information for them to use in this way, rather than to bombard them with historical facts. So if you are studying history, then you might need more information. But this amount of information I'm going to give you in this video tends to be enough for students to use uh, productively in their responses to Blake. So you can see in this video, we're going to be talking about a number of different things. There's nine possible elements of social and historical context that students could refer to. Um, for Blake and it's not even uh, an exclusive list either there could be more um, and as is always the case with the humanities um, there's usually an unlimited amount of information to use so I'm going to keep it to these nine chapters um, about what was going on at the time particularly in the United Kingdom but also across the border across the channel in um, in France as well and America so let's start by talking about Blake's life and work. Again, it might be that you don't need this information at all in an essay, but I think it sometimes helps to understand who Blake was. So born in London in 1757 um, to a lower middle class family. He hated school, um, but he did learn to read and write, as of course is the case. And as you probably more importantly need to know, he was a champion of social justice and he was a believer in the rights of the individual. Um, and he, in his poetry, as we know, um, felt it was necessary uh, for people to question authority and, if necessary, even to rebel against them if they were coming across as particularly restrictive or dogmatic. Um, again, particularly if, they, if the elite impacted negatively on people's human rights. So some useful words here to describe Blake. He was known as a rebel. He was a bit of a political outsider. Uh, he condemns those who wield power, particularly over others who are potentially uh, towards the bottom of the social hierarchy. He had entrenched and radical notions about freedom, which his poetry presents to us. You could also call Blake a libertarian. And he had a deep rooted antipathy towards hierarchies, deeply suspicious of them, uh, questioning those who wielded the most power over others. And he also had an anti-establishment ethos. Uh, as we know, 
In many of his poems, he criticises institutions such as the church, such as the government, such as the aristocracy, and even the education system. So his poetry is full of this suspicion and antipathy towards the elite. Blake um, was well aware, though, that there comes a point when your work could be seen to get you into trouble. And Blake, in fact, did have a very close call with being accused of treason once in his life. Um, so what he often does is he will use metaphorical and quite ambiguous symbolism to conceal, really, uh, his deep-seated antipathy and bitterness. Um, it almost perhaps is seen as protecting him from uh, getting into trouble with the authorities. Um, because at the time, um, the government in the in the British Isles was quite um, conservative based on the French Revolution. So they became a little bit more restrictive. And if you go against that, of course, you're going to get yourself into trouble, regardless if you were a writer or not. Um, so he uses quite innocent, seemingly innocent symbolism like tigers or blossom trees or sunflowers and so on to actually conceal his um, his suspicion and his attack of these um, institutions. So that's who Blake is. Um, so one of the things, one of the themes uh, that forms the backbone of his poetry is the criticism or the presentation of religion. Um, Blake came from a family of dissenters, um, which meant that he had been taught from an early age to question authority. However, he wasn't an atheist. He did have faith. Um, and he was also taught to follow the teachings of the Bible. And he did believe in God, uh, but he did not believe in a punitive God. He did not believe in a God that was nasty. Uh, some of the depictions of God, for example, in the Old Testament, which are synonymous with judgment and, and um, using religion as a weapon to punish. So he chose a more compassionate, charitable, caring, loving God than perhaps some of the visions or versions of God that do exist. But he still was deeply suspicious of the church. And this is obviously shown in poems such as The Garden of Love with that locked chapel on the green, which doesn't seem to have much purpose to anybody because it doesn't serve anybody. Um, in a poem like The Tiger, for example, it shows that Blake is also um, concerned with who the creator actually was and to what extent the creator, as in God, is responsible for creating evil. And that's, that's represented, of course, by the image of the tiger, as opposed to the image of the lamb, which represents something that was good and pure and innocent. So he was also suspicious of what or who the creator was and what his relationship was with evil. In other words, is evil caused by God, in other words. Um, he was also critical of uh, religion and the church more generally for failing to do little, for, for doing little uh, to help reduce the suffering of people in poverty, such as the chimney sweeps, for example, in those poems. Um, and religion started to, um, people started to look at religion through the lens of the age of reason at this time as well. So religious matters became challenged because logic, science and intellect became the preoccupation. Um, and I suppose when you started to look at religious teaching through that lens, um, some things didn't maybe seem to stack up um, and that perhaps fueled that suspicion. Of, of that some had regarding religion and, and the depiction of God and um, just kind of religious teaching generally. So some religious kind of background there. Moving on from religion, um, what was happening in uh, the UK as well at the time was the Industrial Revolution. And many of you, you know, would have probably heard of this before. Uh, basically a growth in industry. So factories, infrastructure, uh, bridges, steam engines. It was this huge boost or this huge boom in industry uh, in this country, of course, um, the Brit Britain emerging also as an empire. So it was part of Britain's boom uh, 
Um, for those of you that want to see a lovely visual depiction of this, you perhaps might want to go and see the 2012 London opening ceremony of the Olympics, which is on YouTube, um, which just gives you a lovely kind of depiction of this change from England, for example, being this green and pleasant land to um, a, a kind of a place of, of factory and work and industry. For some of you, you might be using terms like the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, which also comes under Marxist theory. The idea that these terms, these factories almost act as metaphors for the infrastructure of society in terms of the factory owners being the upper class, the people that had the wealth and therefore the financial control, and the proletariat being the workers who actually did the work to keep those factory owners in wealth. Ironically, though, of course, just like the bourgeoisie need the proletariat, the proletariat need the bourgeoisie for work. So it's in kind of a there's an interplay there. So some of you might be uh, looking at Marxism theory, Marxist theory for these poems and looking at how the Industrial Revolution shows that divide in status and wealth. Um, no surprise, perhaps, that when you get a lot of people moving to cities to work in the factories, you're going to have a decline in working conditions. So we had long working hours, we had poor hygiene, poor wages, many workers, particularly children and also women, were exploited. And of course, at this time, there was a lack of worker unions. Um, so there, were, there, was a, there wasn't really um, anyone uh, or, or a, a kind of a, a company or an institution that would look out for workers uh, as they do, for example, now. Uh, so there was a lack of representation as well. And when you have lots of factories burning uh, and emitting uh, filthy smoke, you're going to get fog that kind of hung over cities all the time. That obviously caused breathing issues for some. Uh, you had dangerous machinery and, and women and children were often preferred as employees, not only because they could be exploited for low wages um, or you know, children sometimes didn't get paid at all, but also because children could be used to work on machines because they had small hands that they could um, you know, unblock machines. And unfortunately, a lot of children were killed uh, due to the lack of safety in these industrial large factories. So not a great, um, you know, depiction of um, British industry, perhaps, even though the Industrial Revolution was responsible for, for a huge growth in the UK economy at the time. Um, and it's, of course, no surprise that Blake is using the Industrial Revolution and looking at it critically in terms of seeing it as a as a thing that is responsible for a lot of suffering and a lot of um, social divides. So that's probably why Blake is going to be using the Industrial Revolution. Um, this was also a time of revolution abroad. Um, the American and French revolutions were going on at the end of the 18th century. Um, the American Revolution was perhaps, of course, more successful than the French because America became a republic and they still are. And on the 4th of July in 1776, uh, they defeated the British and um, they became their own republic. Um, and uh, that was because we were expecting Americans to pay us tax in the UK, which they weren't happy with. Um, so Blake was sympathetic with that uh, revolution, but he was also sympathetic with the ideals of the French Revolution as well. And in this lower paragraph here, I've just kind of got a brief synopsis, uh, perhaps that you might find useful in terms of what the French Revolution was. Basically, in France, the citizens were becoming increasingly angry about the aristocracy and the church who didn't pay tax and were kept in luxury by the working class. Louis XVI ruled with absolute power, but France was also bankrupt because they had spent a lot of money on foreign wars. In order to help him, uh, quite, perhaps quite naively, Louis asked uh, representatives of, let's say, the commoners, uh, ordinary people, to help him um, and maintain some perhaps political credibility. However, what happened was he gave those people a voice and it quickly got out of hand. So uh, in 1789, class war exploded on the Paris streets. You had the storming of the Bastille. 
The prisoners were released inside. The governor's head was cut off and paraded through the streets on a stake. Uh, and the citizens formed their own government and Louis was ordered not to leave Paris. And the new party that was established uh, abolished the privileges of the aristocracy. They it, um, demanded fair taxes. They demanded equality for all citizens, free speech, the right to an elected government. They wanted fair courts. Um, so that was their ideals. And obviously some of those we take for granted now uh, in terms of living in democracy. Louis, though, um, foolishly uh, did not listen, and he and his wife, Marie Antoinette, did try and leave France because they thought other leaders of their ilk would come to their rescue in neighbouring countries. But before they escaped, they were spotted. Uh, a, uh, somebody noticed a resemblance on a banknote, um, and they were um, returned back to Paris, and Louis uh, was beheaded on the guillotine, which became a metaphor of, of what the... French Revolution descended into, which was a lot of panic and paranoia. Um, 40,000 people were beheaded, and so much so that the streets of Paris ran red with blood. And a civil war um, started, uh, and what began as a way to get equality and fairness for all turned into hysteria and panic. Um, so much so that in 1799 the army took control. But unfortunately, the French Revolution uh, wasn't as successful as the American Revolution because in 1804 Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself with the Pope. Um, he actually kept the Pope waiting in, um, I can't remember the name of the cathedral in Paris now, um, the one that had the fire recently. Um, but he was um, Emperor of France, uh, crowned himself Emperor of France, uh, Notre Dame, there we go, it crowned himself the Emperor of France and absolute power um, returned. So in the end, it actually, things pretty much went back to how they were with, with, a, with a ruler, with an emperor. Um, but in summary, Blake was sympathetic to both of these revolutions because it showed that people had the power to overthrow um, the elite. Um, and this is noticeable in some of the poems that he has uh, to do with the, the rights of the individual and the binary between the rich and the poor, for example. This was also a time of philosophical um, reason. Um, you might be referring to John Locke and Jean Jacques Rousseau for Blake. Uh, both of which were concerned with education and the rights of the child. So Locke believed that children were born with Blake's blank slates, the tabula rasa. They were born with personalities and likes and dislikes, so it was innate. Uh, Locke believed that a child not guided by parents would become cruel and irrational. Um, and parents had a responsibility to turn their children away from injustice. Um, and Locke believed that curiosity and liberty guided children most, and that parents should cherish, but also encourage that curiosity in their children and freedom of choice as well. Um, the idea that if you force a child to do something, it would make them miserable. So Locke was also a believer that freedom of choice was important in terms of education. Uh, and he believed as well that the upper class could improve the lives of the lower classes as well. So if the upper class did aspire to something successful, they had a responsibility to benefit those on the lower rungs of the social ladder. Moreover, Jean Jacques Rousseau believed that freedom could be achieved most through a naturalistic education. He stated that everything is good as it comes from the hands of the maker. So the belief of the countryside and the green world and the pastoral being a good teacher for children rather than the rigid education seen in schools and colleges, which he believed to be ridiculous because they were too dogmatic and too restrictive in what students learned. He believed that the city had filthy morals because that was where um, poverty, deprivation and prostitution was. And we see that, for example, in London. Um, and that the countryside would, the, the bucolic depiction of the countryside would protect children from that setting. Uh, 
he also believed that education should be a joyful celebration of childhood uh, and shielding children from the vices of others um, was important as well. So you might, if you have a poem about children, uh, whether that be in innocence and experience, Blake perhaps uh, is, uh, Blake's poetry perhaps is synonymous with this kind of thinking um, at the time. I just want to talk about women and children uh, slightly more. Um, no surprise that women were considered properties of their fathers and husbands, so their opportunities for freedom were limited. Um, prostitution was common among the lower classes because, because women had little to offer in, a, in order to make a living. So think of the prostitute in London, for example, how sympathetic she is depicted by Blake um, in a world of misery um, because she had no other option. Women often received a smaller wage, even though they were doing the same work. You know, that's we see the implications of this even today with the kind of uh, pay gaps between men and women in some sectors. And in terms of children, child labour was prevalent. Uh, mills, mines, chimney sweeps, factories, uh, children as young as six or seven employed in these places. Um, Obviously, labour laws didn't exist yet and unions were not established. So uh, there was nobody there to protect workers' rights. Um, importantly, Blake uses the child as a device to present the purity and sacred nature of innocence and how society can remove this innocence when rendering them as victims with fallen childhood. So again, if you have a poem about children or a poem with a child in it, we have to think about, well, why is Blake using children? Because that's clearly a, a conscious decision that he's using. It's a device of some sort. It's, a, it's an authorial method in terms of narrative perspective. So we have to think about what is, why is he using children? Um, but in terms of children, um, children are depicted in Blake in numerous different ways. They can be predict, they can be presented as innocent, such as in Infant Joy, the Echoing Green, the Lamb or naive, such as the chimney sweeper, or the little vagabond, or the little black boy. Or they can sometimes be presented as victims, such as the chimney sweeper, um, the schoolboy, or London, um, and in others as well, like Nurse, uh, not Nurse's Song, sorry. Uh, well, I suppose Nurse's Song in experience, but also Infant Sorrow, I was thinking as well. So just because you've got children doesn't mean they're presented in exactly the same way all of the time. So perhaps it's worth looking for those discrepancies. It's worth noticing as well that the Augustan era, which is the, the era uh, between Blake's era and the Romantic era um, or the Restoration period, um, women and children were seen as unfit subjects for poetry. So Blake is probably also rebelling against this kind of Augustan habit as well, uh, because clearly he does dedicate a lot of his verse to children specifically. Um, so that's also worth noting. Um, the word romanticism with a capital R, uh, we're not suggesting here that Blake is writing love poetry. This is That's not the romantic that we mean. We mean here the romanticism movement in literature, which was characterised by these things. Love of nature in the green world, the pastoral, uh, the sublime, for example, um, the presentation and foregrounding of the common man, and by man I mean people there, the, the suspicion and rejection of the establishment and freedom from rules, the use of the supernatural and power of the imagination, as opposed to reason and logic, a quest for truth, so to get to the heart of the matter. So lots of Blake's poems have a lot of rhetorical questions in, like the tiger or the lamb, for example. What is the truth of the issue? Uh, the focus of pleasure and sensuality, the importance of childhood and the individual, um, and the responsibility of the individual, and also the idea of rebellion and nonconformity. So all of these aspects seem to suggest that Blake is within the heart of the Romantic uh, movement. Finally, uh, oh no, not to finally, um, penultimately, uh, we could also apply some of the Gothic conventions as well to Blake. Again, these um, aspects are common in Gothic literature. 
um, and numerous of these, uh, numerous poems focus on these. Just to look at a couple of them, uh, multiple narrators and speakers, uh, for example, each poem tends to have a different speaker. Um, lots of focus on the landscape of, of nature. Um, the focus on horror and terror, for example, in London. Um, so you could also, as well as Romanticism, also apply the um, aspects of the Gothic to Blake as well. And finally, just to finish off, um, this is not so much to do, I suppose, with social and historical context, although some of them could come under that category. There's lots of juxtapositions, there's lots of contrasts or binaries in Blake. And I've just listed as many as I could think of here. Um, obviously, the whole collection, Innocence and Experience, is an overall binary. But you can see there's also lots of contrast between other um, aspects as well, as you can see here. So that's something else to bear in mind, that Blake's poetry is full of these binary oppositions. So in summary, then, um, that is a tutorial about some of the social and historical context that Blake that Blake's poetry represents. Again, I just want to repeat what I said at the beginning. This is a literature course, so we don't need to get too obsessed with the history side of it, but to use selectively our social and historical context for Blake to help us interpret the poems rather than just to talk about the context itself. So in A-level literature, you need to be using the context um, to enhance your discussion of the texts, the poems, rather than just focusing on the context and just throwing in stuff about the context because you know it might be accurate. So please always put the poetry ahead of the context. Thank you.